We'll be joining Ben again a little later. Hello, everybody. This week, the EPA remains in high view of Louisville on Applegate Lane, cleaning up mercury found at one of the two homes connected to Mark Hebel. Mark Heibel. Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining us. I'm Doug Profit. And I'm Shay McAllister. At the same time, that agency is considering what to do about the other house. Found packed with chemicals so dangerous, the city initially said burning down that home was the safest option. Grace McKenna and Philip Merrill are live in high view. Our chief photojournalist, Grace, is the EPA any closer to a recommendation about possibly burning down that house? Everybody's waiting for that big decision. Certainly are, Doug, and you know the EPA has not made a final decision yet. They do say that manually removing the chemicals by hand is not an option, but they have some other paths that they will want to consider before settling on whether or not to recommend that the city burn down the home. One day into the EPA's cleanup of mercury at 6211 Applegate, an on-scene coordinator, Chuck Berry, says they'll take their time. It's a slow, methodical process. Right now, the EPA is sweeping the home for beads of mercury, planning to tear up the driveway and pull out the carpeting. It gets woven down into the carpet. Inside that home, Barry says the EPA has found additional chemicals. They're small bottles of this that keep turning up in places with very low volumes in them, and we'll work to try and make sure that those are moved over. While the mercury cleanup is expected to take three days, there isn't a firm timeline for dealing with the other home, described as a hoarder house filled with dangerous chemicals. The city initially proposed a controlled burn, but the EPA is assessing other alternatives. Tuesday, Barry said removing the chemicals by hand isn't one of them. Unknown chemicals in there that are stored in um, makeshift and sort of random containers that uh, no one really felt comfortable doing that. The risk to their own workers is just too great. One method still being considered, though, a mechanical removal. Tearing the house down with an excavator and trying to remove those chemicals out of the way. But again, we run into issues and problems from the disposal side with that, and we have to work through that before we can recommend it. In the meantime, while the EPA works through its options, the city says a controlled bird is still on the table. In addition to those different disposal methods, the EPA is also considering both pre and post burn disposal alternatives before they do make that final recommendation. Live in high view, Grace McKenna, WHAS 11 on your side. All right, Grace, thank you very much. Metro Public Health and Wellness started free mercury testing for neighbors on Monday. If you walked on the property and you'd like to get your shoes or your car floorboards tested, you can do so by making an appointment. Just call the number on your screen. It is 574-6650. More today on a developing story we've been following closely. A massive FBI operation underway in Louisville and Southern Indiana today. The federal agency serving warrants all across Metro Louisville arresting 26 people who are now in custody. According to the news release from the FBI, the investigation was called Operation Frozen River, a joint operation between the FBI, Louisville Metro Police, Homeland Security, and the IRS crossing both sides of the Ohio River today. A federal grand jury indicted, uh, returned indictments for 34 people in connection to meth, fentanyl, and firearms offenses. Right here, you're looking at our video from one of the locations where they were focusing their attention today. This is Northwestern Parkway in the Port, Port, uh, Portland neighborhood. If convicted, the defendants each face minimum sentences ranging from 10 to 35 years, and all each face a maximum sentence of life in prison. Law enforcement agencies are currently still looking for eight different people who are wanted. There was also a heavy police presence in Louisville's Portland neighborhood earlier today. Louisville Metro Police say it started with a trouble run at 18th and Rowan. A caller telling police they saw a man with a gun knocking on all of the doors in the area. Police headed to that area and saw the man enter a home that wasn't his. That man was later identified as Taj Malik Haggard. Police say he assaulted a woman in that house and then barricaded himself inside. The SWAT team was called in to help, and about six hours later, Haggard and two other men were arrested. Police searched that house on Rowan after finding several AR-style rifles, stolen handguns, and black tar heroin. Today, Louisville police released photos of the man they believe robbed and attacked several women in southwest Louisville over the last few months and may have been trying to attack again as recently as Sunday. Police believe this man is connected to a handful of assaults in southwest Louisville. Victims described the attacker as, just as you see in this photo. A black man about 5 foot 10, thin build, wearing all black with a hoodie pulled up over his head and a silky mask covering his mouth and nose. 
Police believe recent news coverage could be pushing him out of southwest Jefferson County to other parts of the metro, and the agency says they are actively following leads. Police are now asking women to be vigilant and aware of your surroundings. If you do see something suspicious or you know anything about any of these assaults, you can always call that anonymous tip line number. You see it there on your screen, 574-LMPD. After two people were killed and five others hurt early Sunday morning in a shooting outside the Southern Restaurant and Bar on Market Street in downtown Louisville, we're talking with a man who knew one of the victims very well. Anthony Johnson has had a friendship with 37-year-old Terrence Bethel for over two decades. Bethel was shot and killed outside the restaurant on Sunday morning. Johnson says he would have never imagined losing his friend so soon, and he says this is especially hard time for Bethel's 10-year-old daughter. Awesome dad. He's an awesome dad to, uh, to his daughter, man. He loved her very much. Um, and I think he had some plans and he wanted to do something with her coming up soon. That's why this is even more tragic. The way he impacted uh, the community, family, friends, it's going to be felt. And that loss is going to be profound. Um, I, I, will, I love him. I'm going to miss him. Louisville Metro Police have said they do not have any suspects in the restaurant shooting. They're asking anybody who knows any information. After all, they say there was a crowd of about 300 people there to give them a call at 574-LMPD. Well, what an absolutely picture-perfect day across Kentuckiana. It feels great outside. It looks gorgeous outside. The river seems like it's calling, Doug. Our camera almost <laughs> looks like we've touched it up out there. It's so uh, beautiful, Ben, but you say that's the real-time view. That's what it really looks like outside. It, it, it is a very, very nice indeed, guys. Yeah, ideal late August weather. About as good as it can get for this time of the year, for sure. Kind of an early fall feel out there. We'll have this over the next several days. Uh, so lower 80s, uh, feeling even a touch cooler than that. Thanks to that really low humidity down to 36%. That dew point number at 53, uh, that is a very low um, uh, number there for this time of the year, which means there's uh, not much moisture in the air. When we had all that tropical air last week, those dew points were well into the 70s near 80. Uh, so just a, a different air mass in place. Our temperatures around the metro right now, we got PRP checking at 82, over to Linden at 83, and most areas in the upper 70s and lower 80s. Uh, just fine out there with a mostly sunny sky, cloudy or some showers over eastern Kentucky. Now there is Hurricane Idalia making its way to the north. It will impact the Big Bend area of Florida by tomorrow morning. We're going to look at the impacts, the intensity forecast in a lot more detail coming up in our complete forecast. For us, just staying very nice, clear and cool tonight. Lows in the upper 50s and lower 60s and around 73 at lunchtime tomorrow. And another mostly sunny day and even a touch cooler tomorrow in the upper 70s to near 80 degrees. I'll show you how long this uh, really nice weather pattern will last coming up as well in just a few minutes. All right, Ben, thank you very much. One of the most well-traveled portions of interstate in all of Kentucky will soon be getting a big makeover. It's the main north-south route. We're talking about a project to revamp the I-65 corridor. Here we go again, stretching from downtown to the Waterson Expressway. Isaiah Kim Martinez is telling us how it's going to happen and when construction is expected to start. Kentucky's Transportation Secretary tells me they're looking at ways to best speed up the construction schedule and invest in a method to close fewer lanes at a time during this process. I asked him how the project team will make that happen. Getting them built around a continuously operating system. That's the big deal. I-65 stretching across downtown Louisville serves as a catalyst for many of the city and state's largest employers. About 130,000 vehicles a day. Dozens of bridges seen from our Sky 11 drone leading to hubs like UPS Worldport, UofL, and downtown hospitals. But Kentucky's governor says many of the overpasses are showing their age, leading to a rehab project that's expected to break ground before next July. One of the first bridges set to be replaced right here over Kentucky and Brook Streets. This is a 30 to 40 year investment that's going to be made here. Transportation Secretary Jim Gray tells me they've already selected a contractor known for completing a similar renovation project on I-40 in downtown Nashville months ahead of schedule. Where we bring the contractor on early in the project in order to help us anticipate the problems that can occur. Gray added the project team is working on a game plan to speed up the construction schedule and more importantly, cut down on lane closures during road work. But that may mean, for example, working some overtime hours. It may be often 24 seven 
in, in some aspects of the project in order to keep the corridor open and functioning. The transportation cabinet hopes to hit the ground running on phase one within the next nine months to improve safety and efficiency in the years to come. In Louisville, Isaiah Kim Martinez, WHAS 11 on your side. And the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet tells us the state's General Assembly has already allocated $100 million to start work on at least three bridges along I-65. We're told the project could require, though, more than $140 million more dollars to expand work to several other bridges. The team is applying for federal grants. Well, the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet is also looking to add a brand new exit onto I-64 eastbound lanes heading toward Shelby County to help assist in the flow of the increasing traffic heading east. Right now, drivers do not have any access to I-64 between the Gene Snyder and Simpsonville. That's a nine mile long stretch before there's any exit or entrance. KYTC says slowing traffic is so bad on I-64 and U.S. 60, it's impacting emergency response times. Poses a risk for emergency vehicles that are trying to get to where they need to go. Um, so we're revisiting that from 2008 and conducting this planning study to receive feedback. Last night, right here at this meeting, the Transportation Cabinet hosted the first of several public meetings for East End and Shelby County residents to get feedback from those living in the area. In the next couple of months, analysts will create models of future traffic flows and expected growth in the area all the way to 2045. By the way, keep this in mind, the next public meeting on this is going to be Thursday at the Highview Baptist Church East from 6 to 8 p.m. Today, an ordinance changing regulations around short-term rentals like Airbnbs was passed in committee, meaning it is moving to the full Metro Council. During today's planning and zoning meeting, the committee discussed changing the current ordinance to regulate the bad actors in the housing system and protect affordable housing. Council members suggest capping the number of conditional use permits while allowing renewing properties to stay as a short-term rental. Based on the numbers that I've looked at, since 2017, we've averaged 157 short-term rentals per year. Um, yes, granted, there's some uh, higher than others in certain years, and there's certain areas of town that have an influx of these short-term rentals in their, their communities. But I think by spreading it out with a cap over the three commission districts at 75 per district, that would spread it out through our communities a little evenly. The Planning and Zoning Committee passed the ordinance 5 to 1. It now heads to the full Metro Council.